Welcome to a deep dive into Oscar Wilde's um, The Picture of Dorian Gray. We're going uh, kind of behind the curtain today with the original 1890 serialization in Lippincott's magazine. Ooh, very cool. Yeah, so get ready for some serious uh, Victorian vibes, right? Now, this isn't just some kind of gothic thriller, though it definitely has, you know, its moments. Right. This deep dive is about so much more than just a creepy painting. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Dorian Gray is really Wilde's, I think, playground for exploring beauty, morality, and the very nature of influence. You know, yeah. All wrapped up in this language that's as decadent as like a, a sugared plum. That's such a good way to put it. So, like, let's set the stage here. We're in the art studio of Basil Hallward, and he's like, just put the finishing touches on this portrait, yeah, but not right. just any portrait, right? This one's of Dorian Gray. And Dorian Gray is this, well, he's this young man whose beauty just completely captivates Basil. Yeah. Maybe even a little too much, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. Wild, like, he doesn't shy away from kind of hinting at just how deep Basil's admiration for Dorian really runs. Mm. And this feeling... You know, this intense feeling, it's its poured into the canvas, right? It's yeah. Like Basil's trying to capture not just Dorian's physical appearance, but like his very essence. Right. His soul. Yeah. And then enter Lord Henry Wotton, uh -huh. our resident cynic. Yes. Love him. He develops a very different kind of fascination with Dorian. It's not like romantic, you know? Right. But it's definitely intense. He's almost um, obsessed with dissecting Dorian's mind, wouldn't you say? Yeah. It's like he sees Dorian as this puzzle to solve. You know, like mm -hmm. Lord Henry, he embodies that cynical voice of the Victorian era, someone who prioritizes beauty and pleasure above, well, above pretty much everything else, right? Right. He's obsessed with aesthetics and Dorian's beauty. That's like his canvas for all these dangerous ideas he has. Yeah. And he really embodies that whole idea of art for art's sake, which was all the rage back then. And speaking of dangerous ideas, there's that line, you know, where Lord Henry says something like, um, those who are faithful know only the pleasures of love. It is the faithless who know love's tragedies. Ooh, yeah. Like, whoa. Wild. He was so good at that, using these really witty, almost offhand comments to hint at this, like darkness lurking beneath the surface. Oh. It's as if Lord Henry is planting these seeds of thought in Dorian's mind. Seeds that will, you know, blossom into some truly unsettling choices later on. Right. But it's that contrast, that tension between beauty and corruption that makes this story so captivating, I think. Oh, absolutely. And of course, we can't forget the portrait itself. I mean, Dorian gets like so swept up in Lord Henry's whole spiel about youth and beauty fading that he makes this wish. He wants to stay young forever, even if it means the portrait ages instead of him. Classic. Right. It's like the ultimate deal with the devil, a Faustian <laughs> bargain, you know? Yeah. And what's striking is how easily Dorian makes this wish. He's so captivated by his own image, by the idea of this unchanging beauty, that he doesn't even seem to grasp the weight of what he's asking for. So last time we left off, Dorian's gazing at his portrait, right? Yeah. And he's just made this wish for, you know, eternal youth and beauty. Right. But um, as we're about to find out, that wish... Well, it comes with a pretty hefty price tag. You know what I mean? Totally. So Dorian, under Lord Henry's like continued influence, he falls head over heels for this um, for this actress. Yeah. Sybil Vane. Ah, Sybil Vane. She's not just like another love interest in this whole kind of you know tapestry of the story. She represents something like pure. Okay. Something genuine. You know, especially yeah. this world that's like completely obsessed with appearances. Totally. Yeah, and she's this like crazy talented young actor is performing Shakespeare in, well, let's just say not the most glamorous part of London. Right, right. It's more like music hall than, you know, the Globe Theater. Exactly. But Dorian is like utterly captivated by her performances, <sighs> especially when she plays like, you know, those classic Shakespearean heroines. Yeah. And this is where it gets, I think, really interesting. It's like he sees her art as this reflection of true beauty. Okay. Something way more real than that superficial world he's, you know, he's slowly becoming accustomed to. Right. In fact, he even says that she's like Rosalind or Portia or Beatrice, you know, yeah. like all those like really strong, independent women from the place. Yeah. But remember, Lord Henry's always kind of, you know. Lurking. Lurking. Always there with the perfectly timed, you know, cynical comment to kind of steer Dorian. Yeah. In fact, he even warns Dorian, saying something like, um. Oh, what's that line? Something like, when one is in love, one always begins by deceiving oneself and one always ends by deceiving others. That is what the world calls a romance. Yeah. So, you know, it's like 
we kind of already see the writings on the wall here. This isn't going to end well. No, it's not going to be good. <laughs> and it's not. Because Dorian's, you know, his infatuation with Sybil, which seems so intense, right? Mm. It just, it starts to fade away almost as quickly as it, like, appeared in the first place. Yeah. And it's all because, um, because her acting falters one night. Yeah. It's like he was more in love with the idea of her, you know. Yeah. With the art that he thought she represented rather than with, like, who she actually was. Mm. It's tragic, really. I mean, Sybil, she's, like, so overwhelmed by her love for him. And she tries to explain to him, you know, that he's shown her the truth of love, something far deeper than any role she could ever play. But Dorian, he's, like, blinded by his ego at this point. And Lord Henry's influence. Yeah. He can't see it. He just sees her as, what's the word? Like Unrealistic. Yeah. Unrealistic, he calls it, right? He's disappointed because he wants her to, like, embody these perfect fictional characters, not be this complex human being right. with her own flaws and thoughts and feelings. Right. Like, and he actually you. tells her to her face that she disappointed him. Brutal. Oh, it's so harsh. And what happens next is, well, it's it's heartbreaking. Yeah. Sybil completely crashed. She takes her own life. Yeah. It's uh, That's a pivotal moment in the story, wouldn't you say? Because Sybil's death, it's the first real consequence of Dorian's wish. Right. He goes home and he looks at the portrait and something's different. Yeah. That painting, which once captured this like youthful innocence, yeah. it now bears this subtle but undeniable mark of cruelty. A cruel twist of the mouth, as Wilde describes it. Yes. And that's when Dorian, I think, truly realizes the nature of his bargain, right? Right. The portrait will bear the weight of his sins, his aging, his corruption, while he, Dorian, stays forever young. Right. Which is terrifying, right? But he's also, like, strangely fascinated by it. Well, yeah, it's this chilling realization that he can, like, indulge in any desire, explore, like, even the darkest corners of his soul. Right. And the portrait becomes, like, this this repository of all his hidden ugliness. So the question is, you know, will he be able to resist that temptation? Or will he just kind of succumb to, you know, all the whispers of vanity and vice? Right. And we'll find that out in part three. So we left off with Dorian facing that, you know, chilling truth. His portrait, it's not just a painting anymore, yeah, right? It's that, like this tangible record of uh, of his soul. Exactly. And, and it's this realization, I think, that really propels him down this slippery slope. He tries to bury his guilt, you know, mm -hmm. to forget about what happened with Sybil. So how does he do that? He dives headfirst into this life of... Uh, pleasure excess yeah yeah he surrounds himself with beauty but you know it's all kind of surface level right very superficial like he's trying to outrun this ugliness he's convinced is inside him exactly and wild really i mean he really goes into detail about like dorian's lifestyle you know okay. all the antique tapestries the rare perfumes the jewels like beautiful things but ultimately kind of meaningless yeah and that's the that's the real tragedy of his choice you know he's convinced that by keeping up appearances by staying physically beautiful that he can escape the consequences of his actions yeah but that portrait hidden away in that locked room right it's this constant reminder of the truth that he's trying so hard to suppress. Right, and it's like he can lock the portrait away, but he can't escape his own conscience, can he? Exactly. And it does catch up to him, doesn't it? I mean, despite all his efforts to outrun his past, he just, he can't silence those whispers of guilt and regret that just keep, you know. They eat at him. They eat at him. Yeah, he has all these fleeting romances and, you know, indulges in all these reckless behaviors, but... No real peace. No. There's that one line, I think it's right after, you know, he's reflecting on another night or whatever, and he says, um... He had drunk deeply of everything. He had crushed the grapes against his palate. Nothing had been hidden from him. Right. But he still feels like untouched. Unchained. Unchained. Like he's escaped it all, you know? Right. But the portrait, it tells a very different story. It does. And then Basil comes back. Oh, Basil. Right. Uh, After all these years. And Basil's heard the rumors, local right? Dice, yeah. The whispers about Dorian, the scandals. And you can tell he doesn't want to believe it. He wants to believe the best of Dorian. Right. He still sees that young man he painted. Yeah. Yes. And Dorian, in this moment of, I don't know, like, twisted pride, panic, he decides to show Basil the portrait. Oh, no. It's like he wants Basil to see the monster he's become. To validate him somehow. Like, yeah. to prove that beauty really is all that matters. Right. But Basil, he's horrified. Of course. I mean, think about it. He poured his heart and soul into that painting. He captured Dorian in his most innocent. Right. And to see it now, 
twisted and corrupted. It's devastating for him. Absolutely. And in that moment, Dorian, he just snaps. He can't bear to see that look on Basil's face, the judgment, the disappointment, and he silences him. The one person who knew him really knew him yeah. before all of this. And there it is, the point of no return. It's dark. It is. That portrait, it's not just a reflection anymore. It's like this weight, <laughs> this burden that he can't escape. It becomes an obsession, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. He tries to destroy it, thinking that, you know, if he gets rid of the image, he can somehow undo everything he's done. But that's the thing about actions, right? You can't just, like erase them exactly and that's the ultimate tragedy of dorian gray isn't it he's so fixated on the physical so convinced that beauty equals freedom that he misses the bigger picture right right true beauty lasting beauty it's about character compassion integrity and in the end it's dorian who pays the price yes Trying to destroy the portrait, he destroys himself. His body finally reflecting all those years of cruelty and, and corruption he inflicted on, on others and on himself, really. It's a haunting story. Mm -hmm. A story about the price of vanity, the danger of unchecked desire, and the true meaning of beauty. It really makes you think, doesn't it? And we hope this deep dive has given you a new perspective on the picture of Dorian Gray and, uh, I don't know, maybe even on your own relationship with beauty and morality. Until next time... Keep exploring, keep questioning, and remember, sometimes the most beautiful things in life are the ones we can't see.